As a future educator, I am really bothered that public schools are being targets for uh, mass shootings. Uh, two days ago was the 20th yeah. anniversary of the Columbine massacre, yeah. but still, two decades later, no major gun control legislation has been passed. Yeah. So my question is, as president, how will you go about keeping our schools safe and keeping guns out of the hands of those who should not have them? Thank you, Ben. And I'm sure that there are plenty of students here who, while you were in um, high school, even middle school, that you had to participate in a drill, right? where you were convened and your teachers taught you about how you need to go and run in a closet because there may be a mass shooter roaming the hallways of your school. And in our America, that should never have to happen. Conversations take place every night. Conversations take place every night between students and their parents. Why do these things have to happen? Why do we have to have a drill like that? To which, of course, the response is because there are people in Washington, D.C., supposed leaders, who have failed to have the courage to reject a false choice, which suggests you're either in favor of the Second Amendment or you want to take everyone's guns away. Supposed leaders in Washington, D.C., who have failed to have the courage to recognize, you know what, you want to go hunting, that's fine. But we need reasonable gun safety laws in this country, starting with universal background checks and a renewal of the assault weapon ban. But they have failed to have the courage to act. So, Ben, here's my response to you. Upon being elected, I will give the United States Congress 100 days to get their act together and have the courage to pass reasonable gun safety laws. And if they fail to do it, then I will take executive action and specifically, what I will do is put in place a requirement that for anyone who sells more than five guns a year, they are required to do background checks when they sell those guns. I will require that for any gun dealer that breaks the law, the ATF take their license. And by the way, ATF, alcohol, tobacco, and firearms. Well, the ATF has been doing a lot of the A and the T, but not much of the F. Mm. And we need to fix that. <laughs> and then... On the third piece, because none of us have been sleeping over the last two years, part of what has happened under the current administration is they took fugitives off the list of prohibited people. I put them back on the list, meaning that fugitives from justice should not be able to purchase a handgun or any kind of weapon. So that's what I'd do. Would this be your first executive action as president? Well, it depends on what else happens. That would be after 100 days. That, that'd be after 100 days. Let's see what happens in the first 100 All right. days. All right. Fair enough. Uh, Angela Garazzo is here, and she is a freshman at St. Anselm College studying international relations. She is uh, from New Hampshire. Angela? Good evening, Senator. My question is, as a college student with over $25,000 of debt in my first year alone, mm -hmm. what will you do to alleviate the financial burdens of the student debt crisis? Yeah. Do you support initiatives such as free college, loan protective legislation, or student repayment plans? Yeah, Angela, and I, you know, listen, the, the, the students in New Hampshire are among the top five in the country with student loan debt. And, um, it is absolutely unconscionable that we have students in America who are in absolute fear about the debt that they will owe upon graduation. And I have met and know so many students who are making decisions about their career based on their fear that they may not be able to pay their bills. I know so many students who have graduated who are making decisions about whether or not to have a family based on the burden of their student loan debt and being concerned about whether they're going to actually be able to get through the month. We cannot afford to have a system like this, especially for young people who have made an investment of their time and their resources because they actually want an education to live a productive life and contribute to our society and be leaders. So here's what I would do specifically. I do support debt-free college. Um, I also believe that what we need to do is we need to allow students to refinance your student loan debt. And in particular, I am supporting an initiative that would allow you to refinance your student loan debt such that it would be on par with the federal lending um, amounts. So for example, if you, uh, probably none of you here, but any of your older brothers and sisters, if you took out student loans between the years of about 2006 through 2013, the interest rate was about 7%. 
What I am proposing is regardless of the interest rate at the time that you took out your student loans, that upon repayment, it would have to be at 3.5%. The other thing is this. Part of the issue is in terms of repayment, there is no connection between what you owe and your income. So what I would be requiring is that there be a robust process by which income-based repayment would be the norm. And finally, let's look at the fact that for all of you and all of anybody who has applied for financial aid, that is an awful process. You guys know what I'm talking about. All those pages, you can barely get through that form. And so part of what we need to do is simplify that process. Uh, but we have got to do a better job in this country because, you know, I look at something like, for example, teachers. You know, I've, I've been spending a lot of time, I think, a lot about education in terms of every aspect of it, from student loans to what we need to do to pay our teachers their value. And the number of teachers who have left the profession of teaching because they can't afford to pay off their student loans. Mm -hmm. um, right now, we're looking at actually a, a, a deficit of teachers based on the number of students that we need to actually teach and the few teachers that we have, especially so, in rural areas. So it's a big issue, and it crosses a lot of subjects. Well, let me jump in here, because if students, I mean, teachers can't pay their loans. Elizabeth Warren is here, as you know. She's, is, she said that she supports um, student loan forgiveness for 42 million Americans. Yeah. Do, would you go that far? Do you support that? Well, I support anything that is about reducing the debt of student loans, and I think that's an important concept conversation they have. Okay, fair enough. Let's move on now. Uh, Ryan Wilson is here. Ryan is a sophomore at Harvard studying neuroscience in California and a supporter of Julian Castro. Oh. Ryan. Hi. <laughs> Good evening, <laughs> Senator Harris. Uh, my name is Ryan, and I'm a constituent of yours from Orange County, okay. California. In a January town hall, when asked about your approach to universal health care, you acknowledged that you'd support eliminating private insurers in favor of a single-payer health insurance program. How do you respond to the 74% of Americans who wish to have the option to keep their private insurers? Well, under Medicare, well, I support Medicare for all. And um, I support it for a number of reasons um, that include the fact that there are a lot of people in our country who simply do not have access to health care because they cannot afford it. And that's unconscionable. And I actually believe it's a moral issue. And it is a sign of whether or not we are going to be a civil society to determine are people going to have access to health care simply because they can afford it, when in fact that should be a right and not a privilege of the few who can afford it. That is the value with which I bring to this discussion. Um, I will also say this. On the issue of this whole dynamic about access to private insurance, you have, of course, private insurance. You can get supplemental insurance and all of that. But let's not be duped by a, a, a messaging campaign that has been waged for years by the insurance companies to have you into believing that you need to defend them. You need to defend yourself. Do you know what? 91% of the doctors are in Medicare. So the idea and the suggestion they're trying to make to you is really a false one. You will be able to have your doctor. 91% of them are in the Medicare system. And I'll tell you another thing, and it's a personal story. Um, my mother. Um, who, you know, my mother was all of five feet tall. If you ever met her, you would have thought she was seven feet tall. She was an incredible woman. She had two goals in her life. Um, she was a breast cancer researcher. Her goal was to end breast cancer and raise her two daughters. Well, she got cancer. And she ultimately passed away from cancer. But if you have ever had the unfortunate experience of going through the healthcare system with someone who has an acute illness, I'm going to tell you what that is. It is having a doctor say to you, have you heard of the term anticipatory grief? Which you hadn't heard before, but when you hear it, it makes perfect sense. Which means you're starting already to grieve the loss of someone that is still around. You have the experience of going in and out of hospitals, helping someone who is frail and weak in and out of cars to get into a hospital. You look at medical charts, and sometimes the medicine jives, sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes people are paying attention to this is the medication that causes drowsiness they don't want or pain that they, they can't bear. You go through the process of worrying about, is there something I can cook that will make you be able to eat and hold down? You go through the process of being concerned that somebody who was on chemotherapy, are there clothes? Can I get you something that's soft enough that you can wear that will not irritate your skin? Now, thankfully, our mother had Medicare. 
But for people who are going through this process, which they are every day in America, for them to also have to be concerned about how they're going to pay that bill is unconscionable. And that's how I feel about this subject. Cost should not be the barrier to receiving the care that will relieve you of pain or help improve your quality of life. And we've got to get this right. Yeah.